Well, here's something I never thought I'd have to read. Language advisory. This conversation contains some occasional adult language. Shocker, professional football. Listener discretion is advised. He's, I'm going to make some moves, and you just react. Well, I was on the left side, and he went outside, and he tried to swat me. And you know what we do when someone swats you and expose? I took both hands and just boom, right in the chest. And the first thing that hit the ground was the back of his head. I mean, he just flat, and I'm like, oh my God, I just ruined my chances. 13 seasons of professional football can go by in a flash. And I was grateful for every second of it. This game gave me everything, not without taking a few pieces of me along with it. Playing offensive line, it's been one of the most rewarding and fulfilling experiences of my life. Now, thanks to Audible, I look forward to sharing insights and stories with you of our favorite NFL stars, and of course, the fraternity of athletes that protect them. Offensive linemen are eternally bonded, and I am proud to forever be a part of the Blocking Brotherhood. I'm Ryan Khalil, and this is Block Forever. Welcome back, my Block Forever friends, or as my producer wants me to call you, my BFFs, but I'm not doing that, zero chance. On today's episode, I'm speaking with a man considered by many to be the greatest offense alignment to ever play the game. I may be biased, but I agree. I'm talking about 11-time Pro Bowl tackle Anthony Munoz, who, after he was drafted by my alma mater, USC, he helped anchor the Bengals line for over a decade. The two of us broke down Bengals' early season issues, including, surprise, surprise, the offensive line, always the scapegoat for offensive struggles, as we all know. We also discussed what he thought Joe Burrow needs to do better, and we compared notes on how we would block Aaron Donald and Von Miller. And then Anthony shared this amazing story of the time he pancaked his head coach, which is something I would advise against. And later in the show, I'm going to check in with former teammate of mine, five-time Pro Bowl guard Trey Turner of the Washington Commanders. He's squaring off against the Bears at Soldier Field this week on Thursday Night Football, only on Prime Video. But first, coming in hot, here's my conversation with the GOAT, Anthony Munoz. What's up? (laughs) How you doing, man? I've been good, bud. I've been good. Good. You know, like most retired guys missing the game. It's funny, everybody always asks me, you know, who do you watch? And obviously, you know this uh, as well as me. Anytime you watch any game, regardless of if you have any kind of skin in the game or not, you you sort of kind of gravitate towards the offensive line. And Yeah, exactly. I you agree. just can't help it. We've been so trained to <laughs> I know. Watch, watch it like it's watching yeah. film. But you played in the 70s to the 90s, so you've – nobody – has a better seat at the table and probably no better person on the planet to discuss how the game's evolved over the years, especially offensive line. And I'm curious, when you are watching games today, you know, what do you see? What are you sort of instinctively thinking about uh, as you sort of compare it to the eras before it? You know, it has changed. I mean, as we all know, I mean, size of players, speed, but to me, it's still basic fundamentals. You can tell the guys that are being taught, you know, some great fundamentals, some great technique, and others that, you know, a lot of times get by with athleticism, and, and you know, they they struggle because of the lack of technique, you know. So I think in in that sense, it's still the same. Uh, you know, old linemen, it's still about you know the steps, the hands, the, the leverage. The old linemen have to be able to put their hand down and knock people back, and you know, create some some space for the running backs to get. So that that hasn't changed. Um, you know, the speed of the guys on the other side of the ball is nuts. I mean, it's crazy, you know, the, the speed that they're coming with. But I still believe even with that speed, if you are fundamentally sound technically, you can combat that. Uh, there's no question about that. Even as an old guy, I'm looking at, okay, what's their best move? How You know, if I was preparing for – you know, an Aaron Donald or preparing for a Von Miller or a Miles Garrett, what would I do? And I watch them and I, you know, I see what they're doing. And, uh, you know, you say, ah, oh, the guy leaned, he shouldn't use his head. He's got to be, you know, have more vision on different. Yeah. So yeah, I do that. I'd love to you know play against all the best and see how I stacked up, you know, in my, in my prime. And, uh, you know, because that's, as an athlete, you're always, you love a challenge and that would have been a challenge. I mean, you got a guy like Aaron Donald who, you know, might be six feet tall, you know, 
probably not even 275, but the strength and speed. I would have loved to see, you know, how quickly I could set on, you know, combat his hands. Because hand combat was a big thing I worked on with a uh, martial arts guy. So that's what it's all about now, you know. And, uh, you know, people ask me, do you ever have concussions when you're in concussion protocol? And I, I wasn't a head guy. I mean, we can't totally eliminate the head. But even from high school, man, if you remember, guys would talk about the paint from the other team on their helmet yeah. and gashes. I wasn't one of those guys because I, I was always a hands guy. You know, if I used my head, I was in, in pass blocking, I was going to be in bad position. Uh, so I didn't uh, use my head. Again, I pulled a lot. So I, I would use it. You know, they pulled me a lot on traps, short traps, long traps uh, when I was with the Bengals. So, you know, it's kind of hard to avoid that. But, you know, I, I tell people and they don't believe me. You know, we did, we would in full pads, if guys used their head and got in trouble, our offensive line coach, we would take our helmets off and do live pass pro, full pads, but no helmets. And that should be fine because you shouldn't use your head. It's all about hands. So, um, but yeah, I'm, I, I'm always watching and say, okay, how would I set? What would I do? Yeah, th there's no question. Uh, I'm sure I'll do it until I'm, you know, in the wheelchair and say, you know, same thing. I never played against Aaron Donald either. He's always an interesting player to watch. You know, when I think about how we would scout players, I mean, you could sort of almost put every D lineman into a category. And, and most of the time it was you had the kind of big, heavy, strong players. And then you had the kind of quicker, smaller, technically savvy high hustle guys and and guys like Aaron they're a little bit of both which which makes him tough to game plan against because to your point he's heavy he can run down the middle he could bull rush you back into the quarterback and you got to you got to use all your might and and technique to to try to wrestle with him but you can't lean on him because he's also quick enough to get on the edge he's savvy enough to hit your hands and and put you in a bad position and to get up feel quick was a guy like that, if, if there was a young offense alignment that you're talking with, what, what sort of advice are you giving to him? To me, we used to stress our eyes were as intense as everything else. You cannot be lax with your eyes. And I really believe that's what the martial art thing taught me was the vision of focus mm -hmm. and taking, like if I knew your best move was inside, Ron, I, would, I wouldn't just pick out the chest. I would take, you know, if you had your number, I'd take the point of your number and that would be my focal point. I wouldn't care about what you look like. My focus with my hands, I could see where the hands were coming. So as long as I caught that spot, and because you got to go wherever that spot goes. You know, don't worry about the head fakes. Don't worry about, you know, how's his expression, you know, looking at me? Is he laughing at me? Is he serious? I don't care. I, if I didn't see your face the whole game, it wouldn't bother me. So that's what I would tell the guys. And we did a lot of that. I would say eyes, intense eyes, take a target. Don't take a big target, take a small target, and then make sure you got the hands up there. And your peripheral vision and your focus should give you enough to see what they're doing and counter. And that's what I would tell them, and balance. He's heavy, so you want to give him a little extra. Really have confidence in your arms and your strength. There's so much of a game within a game. I, I think people don't realize how complicated it is and how, um, you know, you talk about a guy like Aaron Donald and some of these really great uh, rushers I'm sure you went against. The best ones were not only incredible athletes, not only physically fast and strong, but they were also incredibly smart in how they sort of set you up. And they were really great at understanding the flow of the game and how to um, take chances, but also stick to the scheme and still keep their responsibilities. And and it's tough, especially if you don't have a great coach, then you need to have a really great mentor and somebody who's in a room with you. It took me a long time to learn how to have a short memory in the NFL. You know, it's, it's funny you bring that up because first of all, you know, being a pitcher, I, I played baseball. That was my first love. You had to forget a lot. And if I let, you know, some of those wild pitches and pitches almost hit the right. guy, you know, or those balls that were hit affect me, then you're gone. You can't recover. So, you know, I was able to do that, especially at left tackle. So we were taught, I mean, we were taught to really make adjustments on the fly. And when you do that and you're taught that way, you can't afford to think about, you know, what just, what just happened bad. You got to move on and make that adjustment. You also had a great offense alignment in Forrest Gregg who drafted you out of USC. What was that relationship like? It was a great relationship. Uh, I love the guy. I mean, you know, when he passed, it was amazing because of the influence. And Forrest Gregg, he, he played for Vince Lombardi, right? I think he called him one of the finest players he ever coached. He did. Uh, Bengals had hired him and then 
my rookie year was his first year. The amazing thing about Forrest is he was the ultimate head coach. I played for Forrest four years and not one time did he come over and coach the offensive line. But he added so many valuable lessons in the mental part of the game. I'll never forget after my first Pro Bowl, my second year, he took me aside and we talked and just kind of gave me some insight, you know, the challenge now of every play, every snap at practice and in the game, because even your teammates are going to measure themselves against you. You got to be a pro bowler every play now. and Just the mental part of it. And I just love playing for the guy. I mean, it was, you know, because I knew whatever he asked us to do, you know, 50, 60 up downs and full pads. I knew he did them with Vince Lombardi, so I'm not going to complain. You know, so, I mean, it was it was tough, but if you were in shape coming to camp, you could handle it. Forrest Gregg, also incredible offense alignment on those really great Packers teams of the 50s and 60s. When did you first meet him? Was it while you were at SC or not until after you were drafted? So we had won the national championship. We had about three or four guys who were going to go in the first round. So, you know, our strength coach got us to where we were there. So we stayed on campus, going to class, working out. Uh, and really, my introduction to Forrest was they were the third pick. It was the Jets, Lions, Bengals, and Packers. They were the only team that flew me to their place to recheck me again after the combine. And then they called me and said, Forrest Gregg wants to come out and work you out. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. Forrest Gregg, Hall of Fame tackle, Vince Lomb I'm thinking, this is a great opportunity. So he came to, and we, he worked me out there on the practice field for about two hours. About two hours at the end of practice, he said, okay, I'll, and he was still, you know, he's like 40 years old, 250, still in pretty good shape. He was running every day, jogging. He said, I'm going to make some moves, and you just react. Well, I was on the left side, and he went outside, and he tried to swat me. And you know what we do when someone swats you and expose? I took both hands and just, boom, right in the chest. And the first thing that hit the ground was the back of his head. I mean, he just flat, and I'm like, oh, my God, I just ruined my chances. So I bent over and apologized. <laughs> And he's laying it on the ground, you know, kind of half dazed. And he said, ah, don't worry about it, son. It's okay. And he kind of laughed. I said, okay, that was good. So he went back and still, I didn't have any idea what was going to happen. And uh, I guess that after that workout, I showed the, with the Rose Bowl game and that workout and showed him that I was okay. They drafted me, but I'm sure there was a lot of fans back there that were saying, this is a crazy pick. Where were you on draft day? So... There was a little white apartment complex right across from Men's West and Webb Tower, and it was called La Sorbonne Apartments. The lady that owned it, her son was in dental school. So it was all dental students, only about four or five football players, and like three or four of us were married. So we're sitting in that one-bedroom apartment. So when that phone rang a little after 7 in the morning, and with the third pick, I mean, I'm thinking, this is crazy. That situation's crazy to me. I think about the modern-day draft. They're either in New York or they're all in these fancy parties at their homes exactly. and ESPN's <laughs> watching it. And there's like four or five of you college kids just sitting in this apartment with yeah. dental students waiting for NFL teams to call you. <laughs> you know, and I look at the clothes they're wearing now, I'm thinking, my good, I didn't get those at Halfway through my college. Wait, so what are you doing uh, during NFL this time? Career. There's no live coverage of this stuff, right? Well, so the crazy thing about it, 1980 was the first year that ESPN covered the draft, but they didn't fight guys in New York. They didn't have all the film <laughs> clips. And they just sat there and talked about the guys. And I don't even think they mentioned me until the draft, until I was they're like, wait. He's not on our list. What happened? So are you watching this on TV at all? No, or no, no, no. So you're just hanging out and all of a sudden the just phone rings out. and you have yeah. no idea who it is. Well, you see, because it started at 10 a.m. in New York. So that was like 7 a.m. L.A. Right. So it's still pretty early. So I picked up the phone and right away it was a Bengal secretary. And she says, Cincinnati Bengals, can you hold? And I'm like, oh, my goodness. Then I started to, oh, third pick. Oh, my goodness. And I was shocked. I mean, thankful, but very shocked. And my wife and I had to pull out a map and find out where Cincinnati was located. And, uh, but yeah, it was, it was crazy. I tell you what, it was just really nuts. That's awesome. You know, one of the missions I've been on is to sort of learn from the greats who have done it and seen it all and kind of figure out what the real intangibles are for building consistent winning players and franchises. When you got there, the Bengals were a team with a bad record, but you guys ended up making the Super Bowl in your second year. So what, what is that? You obviously had talent, Talented pieces that were there before you got there, they they added a ton in the drafts um, following that. Um, how, what, what were the keys for him to sort of get everybody to buy into a place like that? So first of all, 78, 79, 4 and 12, both years. So with being the worst team in the league, they were loaded. We Our four defensive linemen were all number one picks. 
We had the web, they call it, Whitley, Edwards, Browner, and Burley. Kenny Anderson, who had been around 10 years, one of the most accurate quarterbacks, he had been sacked like close to 70 times a year before I got there. So then Forrest comes in, and he, he hires some great assistant coaches. And then he just basically laid out his game plan. We're going to be in shape. We're going to win. The guy saw that he was serious. The assistant coaches were unbelievable teachers, technically. And he just, he had the plan and guys just believed in it because he came in and he had a plan. If you come in and you're a disciplinarian and all you do is scream and yell mm. and you know, I've done it. No, he had a plan, man. We saw his plan. We knew in September the schedule and it was going to be the same in December. There might be a few tweaks, but consistent with everything he did. And we saw that right away. And we believed in him right away. You played with a star quarterback in Cincinnati, Boomer Esiason. I'm curious how you'd compare Boomer with the current guy, Joe Burrow. Well, first of all, there's a lot of similarities that I see. And I'm not in the locker room with Joe, but uh, just watch it. I watch a lot, you know, interaction players, how guys hang out. And Boomer was amazing. Boomer literally came in as a rookie to the huddle, and you would have thought he was that was his offense for four or five years. The guy was oozing with confidence, uh, swag. I mean, one of the smartest guys. You know, I look at these quarterbacks with the wristbands on their arms, and we had a pretty, pretty complex offense. I tell people, Boomer could have gotten the game plan on Wednesday and Saturday come back with the whole offense and told every player who to block, every play against every defense. And we and our offense was crazy. We had each play was coded three or four ways with the original terminology. Uh, one of the most competitive guys, I mean, there was times we'd have to say, Boomer, go back to the huddle. We'll take care of the defensive lineman. You don't have, that's not your job. Uh, you know, so the guy, I, when I talk about leadership, I talk about leaders that you know, hold people accountable, uh, but encourage people. He did, did that. Leaders know how to connect with their, their guys. Boomer, I mean, there's different ways that he would connect. You know, he would take us all out to dinner. We would exchange gifts. But the one thing he would do is after all the individual meetings were over and we would be ready to go shower, he would leave his quarterback meeting, come into our room and close the door. It was just all the linemen and Boomer, and he'd grab the control for the video and he would start running and he would call the play and we would make the calls. We'd do that probably for another 45 minutes. Not only we're in there with our assistant or our, our line coach going through that, but now we have the quarterback and they're watching tape, calling the plays, calling the defense. We would call it, make our calls. We're, well, no, we got to change this play. So, you know, he was just amazing in that way that he would connect. Uh, he, would, he wouldn't throw anybody under the bus. Love the guy, love playing with him. Uh, and just one of the best. One of the most criticized position groups this season has been the Bengals O-line. This unit only has one guy back from the Super Bowl. What are you seeing up to this point, and how much of the blame do you think is on the O-line versus the quarterback? Uh, to me, it's a combination of the offensive line and Joe holding on a little too much. And, and you know, I know it's a different uh, era, Ryan, I, you know, but to me, how can you get four new guys on the offensive line that have never played together and not take one snap in preseason uh, and that's just, you know, it's a new era. The, the Rams do that. Zach Taylor came from the Rams. Right or wrong, I don't know. The Rams won the Super Bowl last year doing that. But as an offensive lineman, I played next to a guard for eight years, so I was fortunate. My guy, year six, seven, and eight, I still needed some preseason next to him because we, were, we weren't doing that for six, seven months. Now I, I need to see some, some live, some, and they don't do that. Maybe, you know, 10 minutes of blitz pickup, you know, in camp. You don't have to pound, it, pound them to, you know, all practice. But so, again, that's just my take. And to me, Joe's a real thing. But, man, you can't, you know as well as I do, it doesn't matter how big and strong you are. You keep taking those hits in the NFL. It's going to take a toll. And uh, so we got to keep them clean and, so that's that's what I see. That's my humble opinion. Where it's a line and Joe, and they gotta you know mesh and come together and protect them and get rid of the ball a little quicker. Well, I appreciate you for coming on, and and uh, and I appreciate you for having such an incredible influence on my career. I mean, I don't know if you remember we you know we we were rolling a little bit at SC like the yeah. way you guys were when you played, and uh, and all you old time greats came around and and came and, and talked to the young bucks. But you were always so warm and generous and, and and complimentary and gave us incredible confidence. And and I mean, we were so in awe. Obviously, the career you had um, and the kind of person you were, but obviously too, just the presence that you were when you came around and 
I remember one game you came, I think we were playing Arizona or somebody like that at home. I remember the offensive line getting really excited and, and sort of, you know, obviously we wanted to win and not give up sacks and not play bad, but there was something about you standing there watching us huh. that it, there was like something extra happening oh, wow. in our group. And That's we played cool. out of our minds that game. And I remember our coach saying, we got to figure out how to get Anthony here every week. <laughs> well, I appreciate you, brother. Thank you so much. And I look forward to seeing you soon. No, thank you. Appreciate chatting. You can listen to Block Forever and other sports content on Audible. Audible is the home of storytelling, audiobooks, originals, podcasts, and more. Start listening free at audible.com. It feels like it was yesterday when Trey Turner was drafted by the Panthers in 2014. He was incredibly raw, but very talented. Rookie from LSU. They immediately slotted this kid next to me at guard. It only took one game for me to realize he would be playing a long time in the NFL. Six seasons in Carolina. He then went on to play for the Chargers, Steelers, and then this season he's with the Commanders. Trey and I spoke about the differences in blocking for a couple of quarterbacks he got to play for, Cam Newton, Big Ben, and then, of course, Justin Herbert. We also discussed the secrets to our Panthers Super Bowl run from his perspective. You, you've heard all mine. And then he talked about why he considers me a polite asshole, which was the first time I've ever been called that. It's always fun to catch up with ex-teammates who you went through so many battles with, and this is a guy I truly love. I hope you enjoy our conversation. All right, Trey Turner. Let's go, brother. Five-time Pro Bowl guard. First question, how much money did LSU pay you out of high school? Go. I would say, realistically, it was like a $700 dinner because my mom and my dad was there. That's about all I got. <laughs> <laughs> That's about all I got. Uh, well, how, how do you feel about the rumors of SEC guys prior to NIL and all of us always asking about you guys getting bags of money? You know, um, I've been able to see some things in my day and age. I'm just glad it's legal now. I'm not going <laughs> to go further than that. I'm just glad that they could get some money and it's all good. Do you keep up with them a lot or no? Is it a little bit. on and off? A little bit. It's on and off, but I, I, I try to stay relevant. Do I on. feel like such an old timer now. I'm only a couple years removed, but do a lot of guys still keep up with their schools? Is it still the same of like guys making bets on their teams playing against each other in practice? It's not the same. They it's don't not, care? Guys yeah, don't care anymore no, like that? It's, it's not the same. We had, we had a big thing like that in Carolina. It, it was big, but it's not the same anymore. No? no. Why Why do you think that is? Everybody gets here. They just, you know, college is, I felt like college at one point was more like a passion type of deal. Like you really wanted to go to that school. You know, you really had, you know, feelings for your school or, or emotion towards your school. Now it's just a stepping stone. It used to be cool to rep your school. You know, you come with your colors. Yeah. Like on Saturdays, you know, we wear our, I wear my Yeah, we don't wear stuff. our college hats. Like, yeah. And guys don't do that anymore? No, nah, it's not like that. What was your first year in Carolina? 14. And last year was 20. How was I as a, uh, as a veteran guy for you, personally and professionally? Let's start personally first. Can you curse on? Okay. Yeah, you can curse You're a on. Fucking this. asshole, man. I was an asshole, really. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but a polite one. You know, you you didn't describe. How was I a polite asshole? I remember when I first got there, you would talk to me, but you would more so talk at me than to me. I do remember Wait, that. Wait, is this the personal Ryan or is this the professional teammate, like trying to get a rookie right, who's going to play, who I know is going to have to start next? I to feel me. like it falls into like both. You know, you can't you can't have one without the other for the most part. Okay, so let's go back. So, what point does that tone that I have with you change, where it's more, where uh, we're on the same level? Year two, year three. Yeah, I remember I used to step on your feet. You hated that shit. Yeah, it didn't feel great. I hated that. Yeah. So now, okay, so you're the older guy now, and you got young guys coming in. So how are you with them? I hate getting my feet stepped on, brother. <laughs> <laughs> so how are it. you with them? Are you an asshole or are you? I kind of took your traits a little yeah. bit. Yeah, you, you and I learned to. from the guys that came before me. Cause you, it's a, it's a, it's a mix. It's one thing being cool, but it's one thing being cool and knowing your job, doing your job, and right. performing. You know, whether that be, you know, technique wise, whether that be, you know, sometimes just getting on people because it's been a long day, it's hot outside. You don't want to go as hard as you were, but knowing all the battles that you had been in and the information that you was giving me, I now see myself. Be, coming from those battles, giving that information out mm -hmm. to younger guys. So 
Um, it was it's definitely like a like you know one of those moments where you look back and you're like, damn, I understand it now. You know, I give you shit all the time, but everybody knows you had a great career, great guy, great person. So I was able to to emulate somebody to the best best ability that I could, and you was doing literally everything at the highest level that you could. So I, I truly do appreciate you for that. Just showing me the right way, you know, just the small things of yes sir, no sir, thank you. Being who you are, if I say I'm gonna do something, I'm gonna do it. If I can't do something, hey, I really can't do it. And um, sticking to to what you believe. So what do you do with a guy that you know has talent? Like when I saw with you, I was like, man, this guy's good, but also like he's got to be good. He's got to be great immediately because he's starting right away. Right. But that's not always the case with every guy. How many guys have you tried to reach out to that just don't want it, or they they say they'll figure it out themselves and they don't? A couple. So what do you do? Like, how do you approach a guy like that? So it, it's two things that that I found. You always get the respect. You get the respect because of the time, the accolades, and all of that type of stuff. <clears throat> so you get the respect of players. But what I'm, what I, what I kind of see is like people are setting their ways, and that's one thing that that was opposite to me. When I first got in the league, it wasn't. I didn't have any ways. I just was kind of just playing ball, you know. Um, so I was able to develop certain ways and techniques and stuff. And uh, a lot of younger guys just feel like they have it. Some do, you know, rightfully so, some do. But some people need refinement. And I think one of the hardest things to do, not only in football, but just in in life, especially in this day and age, is critique. Because people think critique means criticism. Critique is just me correcting you, you know, like telling you something. Because I've, if I've been there, if I've done it already, I have the experience. Mm-hmm. So let me show you my scars so you don't have to get the same scars. Like, look, man, I did this. I messed it up. This is what you need to do. You know, sometimes people just like to touch fire on their own. So you just let them touch fire, man. Was that ego for some guys, you think? I don't know if it's or ego. But just not used to getting that kind of criticism. You've been here since you've been 12, 13. You're the best. You're the best. Oh yeah, you got it, you got it. Well, I don't care what you do, you just go play ball. That stigma, that that interpretation of what people telling you starts to stick in people's mind. And they think that's what it's supposed to be rather than learning from the OGs. You know? <laughs> the NFL's tough because we have such a short lifespan mm-hmm. and it's like it's a hard balance sometimes because you know, you want to establish a good relationship with somebody, but you also there's a sense of urgency of like, no, we gotta we gotta be good and we gotta be good right now. Right now. Like you gotta figure this shit out right now. Yeah. We don't have time to bond and you not step on my feet. The weird thing is I felt like we had more time back then compared to now. What do you mean in terms of what? Like I just felt like the 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 amount of time that we had to become cohesive and to become like a unit and to de- to develop more so in the off season, like leading up to like training camp and stuff. Now it's more so like it's just rapid fire. Like guys come in, guys get in. You know, like I felt like in Carolina, that was the only place that I could honestly say like we had a line of guys, like like a real line. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's hard to explain what that means because you you know what that means. You know what it feels like. You know what it looks like. But to have like a real line, like, yeah, it's, it's, it's rare. Do you think the coaches today are too soft on the players? I feel like the <clears throat> the league is starting to turn into more so of a players league than it was when I first got in where it was kind of like, a, hey, this is what we doing. This is how we doing it. Get in line and do it. And you could kind of see it from the most part of like, well, you might have a few good players on a team, but you don't have a team, like a good team. And we went to the Super Bowl, right? I'm sure, I mean, me and you know, but if you go and you na- ask random people, name name 10 players on that team, they wouldn't be able to do it. They would not be able to name 10 players on that team. But we went to the Super Bowl because we were a team, like a well, literally a well dog machine. Not one person going out there making spectacular plays, 11 guys with one mindset, one mission. You know, we was able to get to the biggest game they had. Does that change how you think or approach the game? I'm kind of like a one train mind type of guy, especially on game days. I only know one thing, and that's just to fuck people up any way that I can. I didn't care who it was. It could have been a ref, it could have been a player. Like, I just one track mind, get the job done. And I realized I got to be the same guy every day. I can't come on Monday, Tuesday and be, you know, good energy than Wednesday and Thursday. Like, oh, I don't want to talk to anybody. 
I gotta be the same guy, be as consistent as possible, go through my work and do my work every day. And that, I think that becomes the hard part. Football becomes the easy part. More important for a good offensive lineman or a good quarterback? <laughs> it's funny because coach said all the time, you know, give him some confidence. Give him some confidence. And I didn't really understood, uh, understand what that meant until, you know, maybe year four, year five, right. like really, real life, give him some confidence. Because if you look, quarterbacks see ghosts sometimes, especially when you, you know, let them get touched early. So man, just just keep them upright, give them some confidence, and let them sling that thing. And then they, once they get in the groove, you know, I feel like I feel like if you keep a quarterback up, everybody's capable in this league. They can make some plays, they can make some throws. Goes back to keeping them clean, keeping them upright. Yeah, Ben could take a hit. He don't like to. He'll rather be clean. Justin again could take a hit, but he give a hit too. I I give him that hit. Be able to take the ball, run down the field, he'll hit somebody. And Cam, you know, Cam attracted the energy. Cam wanted that. Cam wanted people in his face. He wanted to, you know, um, go out there and show his toughness. But when he was able to keep Cam up, let him go through his progressions, go through his reads, uh, he cut people up all day. So I, I understand how important it is just to keep a quarterback clean, give him a good mental space. All right, that's the show for this week. Big thanks to Anthony Munoz and Trey Turner. Love catching up with these big fellas. Hope you learned a thing or two that maybe changes the way you watch these games. And of course, don't forget to look out for new episodes of this show, Block Forever, each and every Wednesday throughout the season. That's it for me. Talk to you next week. This has been an Audible original production of Block Forever, produced by Fresh Produce and Audiorama. Matt Waxman is our lead producer. Sound design and edit by Kenny Holmes. Our producers are Kenny Holmes and Matt Schrader. Production assistant, Ben Gerstel. And our talent booker is Kristen Dunn. For Audible, executive producer, Pat Shaw. For Audiorama, the executive producer, well, that's me, Ryan Khalil. For Fresh Produce Media, executive producers, Colin Moore, Joe Killian, and Jason Ross. Head of production, Elena Bobbins. Our supervising producer is Jamila Zara Williams. Production coordinator, Henry Koch. And our production manager is Herminio Ochoa. Special thanks to Powerhouse Capital and Mikey Fowler. And I'm your host, Ryan Khalil. Copyright 2022 by Audiorama Inc. Sound recording copyright 2022 by Audible Originals LLC. Block forever.